Well, good morning. Thank you, Shaquille and Anthony, for leading us this morning. And it is always a joy for me to be here at St. Andrew's Kirk. I was reflecting as I was in the back about my first time coming here and how different it was. And since I've been here, now I can say on numerous occasions, I feel very much at home. But I'm sure that most of us, at one time or another, have heard someone say, know thyself, or know yourself. And by this term, know yourself, they are calling us to face the reality of who we are. And many times, people take the call to know themselves, to look within themselves. But the truths that we learn about ourselves by looking in ourselves are few and far in between. We really only truly know ourselves when we look outside of ourselves and we look to the creator who made us. And he has revealed all that we need to know about ourselves in his word. It is in God's word that we learn about ourselves generally. And one of the first things we learn about ourselves in God's word is that he created us in his image and in his likeness. But the word also teaches us that we have fallen into sin. And because we've fallen into sin, we are broken and fallen people. God's word also teaches us that we are fragile people and uses words like mist and breath and shadow to describe our brief days on this earth. But I think one of the most telling and unwelcome descriptions of who we are as humans and the life we live on this earth is found in Job chapter 14, verse 1. And this is what it says. Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. These words are true of all of us, brothers and sisters. Job is the iconic person of troubles and trials and tests. And as he mused about his life in the midst of his suffering, he said, man born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. Friends, trouble in one form or another, to one degree or another, is our ongoing lot as we traverse this earth. Now, I know that there are some people who don't believe that. They believe that you can have enough faith or think positively, and if you do, you'll have no troubles, no financial troubles, no relational troubles, no health troubles, Whatever kind of troubles they think, if you have enough faith, you think positively enough, you can wish them away. But such people are doubly disappointed when trouble comes, because trouble will come. Because what Job said is true. Man born of a woman, mankind in general, few of days and full of trouble. I have no doubt this morning in a congregation this size that there are some of us who are facing trouble in one form or another. Some trial, some difficulty in life, perhaps even severe and lingering for many years. But the good news is that God did not leave us without help to navigate the troubles of life. And the primary means of grace that he has given to us to guide us and to direct us through life's troubles is his word. And this morning, I want us to consider a particularly helpful psalm that has a lot to say to us when we face trouble. And that psalm is Psalm 77. So if you've not yet turned there, please turn there in your Bible, Psalm 77. Let me pray for us before we begin. Father, we thank you for your providence in all things. 
We thank you, Lord, that we are not here by accident or even by personal choice, but you in your sovereignty have brought us here together. And I ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, you know where each person is, and you have the ability to speak to us through the preaching of your word this morning in ways that are personal to each of us. God, would you give us ears to hear and hearts to obey all that you say to us. Speak to us now in the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 77 was originally written as a personal psalm. We know this because the first 12 verses of the psalm is written in first person singular. It was written by the psalmist Asaph in a time of trouble. We don't know the circumstances of his trouble. We don't know the source of his trouble. But whatever his troubles were, they affected him greatly. And we see in verses 1 and 2 that he's crying aloud to God day and night, and yet there's no comfort in his soul. In verses 3 and 4, we see Asaph moaning. And he says, my spirit is faint, and he's unable to sleep. And in these opening verses, Asaph gives us a window into a time of severe trouble in his life, even though he doesn't go into the specifics. But what we see is, is, this, is that this psalm that began as a personal psalm became a community psalm. God inspired Asaph to write this psalm, not just for himself, but for the whole community of God's people. And that's why we have it as a part of our Bible. And we have it as a part of our Bible because we are people who face trouble. And this is God's expression of care and kindness for us, that he would give us his word that can carry us in the midst of our troubles. And the reason that this psalm is instructive for us is that we see from Asaph's experience in Psalm 77 that in times of trouble, rather than question God's goodness, we need to remember God's faithfulness. I want us to consider from Psalm 77 how this is true this morning in our remaining time. And for those of you who might be taking notes, I've organized my thoughts around two very simple points, and they are, number one, questioning God's goodness. That's what we see Asaph doing in verses 4 through 9. We see in verse 4 that in the midst of his troubles, Asaph is unable to sleep. He says to God, you hold my eyelids open. And I'm sure all of us who are adults, whether present or joining online, at some point in your life, you've experienced some trouble, some trial that has robbed you of sleep. I think most of us can identify with a time where we were in bed just tossing and turning, but sleep evaded us. We also see from verse 4 that Asaph's problems robbed him of speech. He was not in a talkative mood. He said, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. And I think most of us have been there. Perhaps it was a time where we found ourselves in some trial, some difficulty. We just didn't have words. Indeed, we didn't want words. We had no desire to speak with others. We preferred to be alone. And naturally, when we can't sleep and we don't feel like talking, we tend to do a lot of thinking. We tend to do a lot of inward thinking and reflection. And that's what Asaph does in this psalm. In verses 5 and 6, we read, I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. 
So Asaph begins to reflect on his past and he begins to reflect on the old days and the old times. And no doubt he reflected on what he considered to be the good days and the good times when he wasn't facing problems like he currently was facing. Asaph tries to encourage his heart by remembering and singing a song in the night. And this reference to a song in the night is more than just a reference to a time of the day, but it's more a reference to the state of his soul. Most of us have gone through, and if you, long, if you live long enough, you will go through what some theologians call the dark night of the soul. So when our soul is heavy and our soul is downcast, And in the midst of Asaph's troubles, he tries to remember his song in the night. He tries to remember a song that is appropriate for the state of his soul to encourage him, to strengthen him in the darkness that was upon him. And perhaps you've done the same. I know in my dark night of the soul, one of the songs that I regularly turn to is an old hymn Whatever my God ordains is right. The first verse says, Whatever my God ordains is right, his holy will abideth. I will be still whatever he does and follow where he guideth. He is my God, though dark my road. He holds me that I shall not fall, and so to him I leave it all, and so to him I leave it all. But you know, there are some dark nights of the soul that are so dark that finding a song that speaks to your discouraged soul is like finding an item in a dark room. Sometimes in the dark night of our soul, the song of the night escapes us. We aren't able to find it. We see that Asaph in this psalm, he is not just aiming to sing. He wants to meditate. That's what he says in verse 6, let me meditate in my heart. He wants to turn his heart and mind to God and to God's word. And as he meditates, his heart begins to both wander and wonder. He begins to wonder about God. In verses 7 through 9, his thoughts within himself are such that he asks God, or he asks five questions of the Lord. Look again at what he asks the Lord in verses 7 to 9. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Again, we don't know the circumstances that Asaph faced that brought him to this place, but they seem to relate to his sin and God's punishment. We get this hint in verses 7 to 9, where Asaph questions whether God would spurn forever and whether he has shut up his compassion in anger. And I'm sure this morning that all of us who have served the Lord long enough can identify with Asaph. When we sin and God disciplines us, and it seems like the time of discipline is so long that it will never end, And sometimes we face trials and difficulties that cause us to wonder, is the Lord punishing me for that past sin? Sometimes we're just facing trouble and trials as a result of living in a broken world. But still we wonder if God might be punishing us for some old sin that we committed. One of the things I want you to notice this morning is that all of the questions raised by Asaph have something in common. All of them question God's goodness. 
wondering if God would reject his people forever and never be favorable again, wondering whether God's steadfast love has possibly ceased forever, wondering if God's promises have finally and permanently come to an end, wondering if God has forgotten to be gracious, wondering if God in his anger has shut up his compassion. Brothers and sisters, how can these things be true of a God who is long-suffering, whose steadfast love never comes to an end, a God who tells us that his anger will not last forever and that his grace has come to the undeserving. A God who does not deal with us according to what our sins deserve and whose compassion on us in our sin. But oftentimes, Asaph's experience is our experience. Oftentimes, when we face trouble and trials, we question God's goodness. We question whether the unchanging God has changed. And perhaps you're facing troubles this morning. Perhaps your questions are not Asaph's questions, but they're questions nonetheless. And directly or indirectly, they question God's goodness. Perhaps you're asking, God, where are you? Do you care? Why did you let this happen to me? Why are you allowing me to walk through this and for so long? When will this end? When will you hear my prayer? Am I really saved or am I deceived? Brothers and sisters, this morning, whatever your questions, I have no doubt that like Asaph's, your questions go directly or indirectly to questioning the goodness of God. Psalm 119 verse 68 tells us why we should never question God's goodness. It says, you are good, and you do good. Teach me your statutes. Brothers and sisters, goodness is one of God's attributes. And God holds all of his attributes equally and perfectly at the same time. And because God is perfectly good, all that he does is perfectly good. Not good as we define good in our earthbound and human limitations, but good in fact and good in truth. All that God does to us and for us and in us is good and for our good. This is the witness of Scripture. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 28 in the New International Version. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Brothers and sisters, all things means all things. We're not called to believe this, or we are called to believe it. We're not so much called to understand it. But we need to believe it because it is the God who cannot lie who has said that he does this is at work in your greatest trial, your greatest trouble, for your good, for my good. Whether we understand that or not, brothers and sisters, let us hold on to it and let us believe it. But what we also see in Psalm 77 is that Asaph did not remain in this place of questioning God. Instead, what we see is Asaph goes on to begin to remember God's faithfulness, which brings me to my second and final point, remembering God's faithfulness. This is what we see Asaph doing in verses 10 to 20. Look again at what he says in verses 10 to 12. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. When Asaph refers to God's right hand 
in verse 10. It's a shorthand reference for God's mighty acts of deliverance on behalf of his people. Those times when God fought for his people, expressing his covenant love for them. Asaph is essentially saying, rather than wonder about God and question his goodness, I'll instead focus on the times when he has acted in the past on behalf of his people. On the times when he demonstrated his goodness to his people. In other words, rather than wonder about and question about God's goodness, Asaph decided to look back on God's track record, his track record of goodness dealing with his people. See, rather than speculate in the present about God's goodness, we, where we can't really see all things, we can look back and we can remember his faithfulness in the past, which can more clearly be seen. In verse 12, Asaph says, I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. And notice where he starts in verse 13. He starts with the holiness of God. He says, your way, O God, is holy. It's almost as if Asaph is saying, Lord, forgive me for wondering about who you are and questioning your goodness. Your way is holy without blame, without blemish, without fault. By holy Asaph is saying, God, you are free of accusation. That's Asaph's admission in the midst of his troubles. But no fault can be found with the Lord in his ways and his dealings with his people. He's saying, God, your ways are altogether just. and They are altogether right. And brothers and sisters, this must be our conviction and our confession as well. In good times and in bad times, but especially in bad times. His dealings with us are holy. His dealings with us are just. And we must, like Pontius Pilate, say, when Jesus appeared before him, I find no fault in him. Brothers and sisters, those of you who are at this moment facing trouble, is this your confession? That God's way is holy and that you find no fault in him? But that's not all that Asaph says. In verse 13, he asks, what God is great like our God? And here he reminds himself that God has no equals. He has no rival. He is not the winsome, lose-some God like great athletes or sports teams who win most of the time but lose some of the time. So because God has no rivals, we can always be sure that his sovereign purposes and his sovereign purposes alone are being worked out in our lives, no matter what things look like. In verse 14, Asaph reminds himself that God works wonders, he works miracles, he has shown his power among his people. And here, Asaph has in view the hostile nations that the Israelites encountered during their turbulent history up to the point that he was writing. And the point seems to be, the point that Asaph seems to be making is that when God doesn't act, it's not because he lacks power or that there's some other power that is greater than he is. No, God acts as he pleases, when he pleases, how he pleases. He has no rivals. Then verses 15 to 20, using poetic language, Asaph remembers and recounts God's greatest act on behalf of his covenant people, their deliverance from Egyptian slavery. In these six verses, Asaph poetically describes the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh and his armies. The time of Israel's slavery in Egypt was one of great trouble and great oppression. And God delivered them out of it. 
In verse 19, Asaph says, Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were not seen. Asaph seems to be saying that God's way was a way that seemed less than ideal through the sea and through the waters. And brothers and sisters, sometimes that's God's way. It's a way that we would rather not choose. It's a way that we'd rather not walk. I'm sure as Israel walked through the Red Sea, they were more concerned about drowning than passing through it. And perhaps that's your lot this morning. God's way is not the way that you prefer, and you're wondering if you're going to make it through. And I say to you this morning that by God's grace, you will make it through, because it's the sovereign way that the Lord has chosen for you to walk through. Brothers and sisters, when God was with Israel, his way was not visible. He was leading them by the hands of Moses and Aaron, but his way was not visible. What Asaph says to us in verse 19 is something we can easily read over. He says God's footprints were unseen. In other words, God was with his people, but it was not obvious to their eyes that he was with them. And the truth is that, like with Asaph and all of God's people, we aren't able to really see that God was with us until at the end. They were able to see that God was with them after they'd crossed over and they'd seen the destruction of Pharaoh and his armies. But oftentimes, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the trouble, we question, is God with us? But after they crossed over, they could say with all of their heart, with great conviction, God has been with us even though his footprints are not seen in the wet mud of the Red Sea. And again, brothers and sisters, it's no different with us when we walk through our trials. The Lord is with us. He is with you this morning, even though his footprints are not seen. Asaph's example is instructive for us this morning. As Asaph remembered God's mighty deeds, he said, I will refer to the years of the right hand of the Lord, but he recounts one of the many mighty deeds that God did on behalf of his people. He took time just to recount one of them. He recounted God's greatest act on behalf of his covenant people, delivering them out of Egyptian bondage. And brothers and sisters, we must do the same. Thank God for the times when he intervened in our lives, when we faced trials and troubles when he opened that door of employment that we so desperately needed, when he healed our body when it was ravaged with disease, when he comforted our soul in unimaginable grief, when he restored that relationship that seemed hopelessly broken, when he met us in a time of financial need when financial ruin loomed over us and our family, and the list goes on. But brothers and sisters, above all else, we must look back to that act and that place where God demonstrated his goodness towards us. And that act is his greatest act of redemption, and that place is a hill called Calvary where Jesus hung on a cross as a substitute for sinners like you and me. We must look to that place where when we were without merit and without strength, Christ died for us. So we don't look around in our lives to see the goodness of God. No, we look back to see the goodness of God. We look back to that act and that place where God's goodness was shown to sinners who didn't deserve it. And brothers and sisters, if we reflect on Calvary aright, we cannot help but, but see the goodness of God. We will not question his goodness towards us. Paul says it this way. Paul says, if God did not spare his only son, 
how much more will he with him freely give us all things? God has demonstrated his commitment to our good in that great act of redemption in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, if you're facing trouble, or perhaps you will in the days ahead, my prayer for you is that you would reflect on the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the remedy for any present doubt about God's goodness towards us. No doubt some of you this morning who are present or perhaps watching online do not know the Savior. You do not know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins. You are not able to say with conviction of soul, it is well with my soul. My sins have been forgiven. And I've been reconciled to God. Perhaps that's where you find yourself this morning. And if that's where you are, I say to you that your greatest need, your greatest trouble, your greatest trial, is not what you're experiencing in this life. Not some temporal matter that you will leave once this life is over. Or that can be changed in a moment of time. No, friend, your greatest need this morning is to be reconciled to God. Your greatest need this morning is to be forgiven of your sins and to be spared from the wrath to come. And the good news is that Scripture says that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And Scripture says that all who come to him, he will never turn them away. And so this morning, if you do not know the Savior... I say to you, allow that to be the focus of your attention this morning because that is your greatest need. And I pray that you are hearing a Savior calling you. I pray that you are hearing his voice saying, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And if you come to him, what you will find is a Savior who is quick to pardon all of your sins, whatever they are. No sin too great. He will pardon and he will receive you forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have not left us to ourselves in trouble. Thank you that you have revealed yourself to us on Calvary's cross to show that you work in all things for our good and therefore we need not trust or we need not doubt your goodness but we can trust your goodness and trust your faithfulness whatever trial or difficulty we face. Lord, I pray you would draw near to those who walk through trials and troubled this morning. Would you assure them, O Lord, of your love and care? And O Father, I pray, especially for those who do not know the Savior, have mercy on them, Lord. Would you open their eyes to the beauty of Christ? Would you open their eyes, O Lord, to the eternal life that only you can give? And would you bring them from life from death to life, for your glory. We ask all these things. Amen.